City of Stevens Point Historic Preservation Design Review Meeting, recorded March 3, 2021. Okay, you want to roll call? All right, Seepert? Here. Jennings? Here. McComb? Here. Scripps? Here. DeBush? Here. McFarland? <coughs> Was excused and Kamer? Here. Perfect. Okay, a uh, report from the February 3rd, 21 meeting. Uh, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes. Anybody? So move. This is Mary. Yep. A second, please. Second. Mr. DeBush, thank you. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. Item three, discussion and possible action on the goal, strategic goals. Adam, you want to take us through those? Absolutely. Let me just quick jump over to the document real quick. So as the commissioners recall, the last few months we've been talking about strategic goals for this commission. Back in January, we discussed, you know, initially discussed the concept of strategic goal setting, followed by asking each one of you to submit individual goals that you would like to see the commission undertake in, during this year and throughout the next five years. Last month, we talked about more of these collective goals upon disseminating each of your individual goals. So this ultimately culminates into the document that was included in the agenda packet, the strategic goals document that will, you know, effectively be a guiding principle for staff and for the commission for the next few years in terms of uh, what should what should be priorities going forward. So as you can kind of see, so the third page here talks, you know, just talks about the basic goals of the commission as outlined within chapter 22, starting with uh, designating historic structures and then going down to um, subsection E discussing effectively the facade improvement grant program. So before we go start talking about each individual goals, there's a couple points that I wanted to point out. So first of which is that this document is going to be, you know, as I said, a guiding document that it, there, there will be it will be subject to change over time and in fact i expect there to be changes in terms of you know exact timelines and achieving each step of a goal or who specifically going to be involved in each step or even the steps the processes to undertake each goal you know depend there's likely going to be several variables that will impact you know how soon or how prolonged a goal takes if it's uh, financial reasons, if it's timing, if it's, you know, specific community engagement initiatives that may prolong the process. So um, the purpose of this meeting today will be to discuss each goal, outline the steps, understand some of the challenge challenges to enact each step, but also understanding that this is subject to change, that there is some fluidity with this. So that's just something to keep in mind. So we can start with the first goal. So I think, so the first goal was to adopt a demolition by neglect ordinance. So last month, I think we discussed as a commission, the idea of a demolition by neglect ordinance for several months now. I believe last month was maybe the first time that we had a pretty long, robust discussion as far as what, an or what the ordinance is, what are some of the steps that other municipalities have taken in terms of um, procedural motions for um, enacting a demolition by, ne by neglect ordinance and administering it. So some of the steps that you see on the in the agenda packet for this goal is to basically first off city staff producing this draft ordinance outlining the three essential themes that should be discussed First of all, outlining what conditions would be um, constitution, constituting demolition by neglect. Secondly, how to determine whether or not demolition by neglect is occurring. And then lastly, the enforcement side. And as I mentioned last month, that there will be uh, pretty significant 
collaboration between city staff upon writing the ordinance and the um, city attorney beverage as well, just to make sure that whatever the document that we do produce is of legal soundness. Once we produce the ordinance, um, we'll kick it back to this commission for initial discussion, hear your thoughts, hear any revisions, changes that we want, that um, you would like staff to change. And then um, depending on how long that process takes, this commission will subsequently vote vote on it and then followed by common council as well. So some of the challenges that, challenges that we outlined, so first of all, is <laughs> focusing in part on the education standpoint of an ordinance. Even and I'm thinking of it more so of, you know, should an ordinance be passed by this commission and council, better educating members of the public, specifically property owners within the design review district, the historic districts, to know what what this ordinance entails. That would be something that this commission and staff will likely need to focus on as part of the implementation standpoint. Secondly, another thing that uh, staff discussed too is, you know, as I alluded to before is, you know, what type of enforcement strategy would be best suited? Should it be like, I believe how Madison does it and other municipalities nearby where the enforcement the enforcement mechanism is similar to you know how staff here in the community development department handles you know any non-compliant situations either from a zoning standpoint from a neighborhood improvement standpoint where you receive your non-compliance letters you have so much weeks depending on the situation to comply and then subsequent violations would result in eventually recurring citations so i think that's something that you know we would have to have a discussion among staff and the commission to determine what would be the most appropriate route from an enforcement standpoint. So I think the purpose, like I said, for each of these goals is to, you know, let this commission, each commissioner kind of, you know, talk about what they like, what they don't like. If there's any changes that you want to see with this document, be more than happy to hear it from you. I have a question. Sure. Um, I obviously missed last month, uh, and maybe you discussed this, but it would seem to me like the first thing, or one of the first things to do is identify the properties to which this applies, because I um, was never thinking this applies to any building. It's historic buildings. And so mm -hmm. um, understanding the lay of the land in terms of the the whole city, not just the core of the historic district downtown. So where does that fit into this? Yeah, good question. So that will likely, that will likely take place more in the outlining the conditions that are considered, you know, demolition by neglect. So one of the things that I talked about last month is, you know, more so from a, um, more so just laying the information out there that what staff in this commission needs to or preferably undertake is specifically outlining, hey, these are the specific instances where demolition by neglect would likely be occurring. So if it's a uh, deterior deteriorating chimney, for example, like so specifically outlining what are examples of um, conditions on a historic building and a historic structure that is considered demolition by neglect. And once we establish those parameters as far as what are these conditions, that would be the precursor to determining, you know, what historic buildings currently in the design review district, the historic districts would be potentially eligible for a demolition by neglect. And of course, you know, part of the review standpoint would also occur from the uh, building superintendent as well. So, but at least outlining what conditions would represent demolition by neglect would be that first step with identifying properties that would fall within that being the next step. Anybody else? Okay. 
All right. So let's jump on to the next goal, if there's not, no other comments for the first. So the second goal was to make the city's website more interactive and user-friendly when navigating any specific web pages on the city's website related to this commission. So one of the things that we talked about last month is, you know, this is kind of going to be more of a, a twofold approach. First off, looking at the existing documents, looking at the existing web pages and understanding, you know, what, where are there um, files or where are there web pages rather that need to be updated if it's inaccurate information or updated contact information? Because I know that was something when I first um, started with my tenure with the city is that there was still information that, you know, say contact for contact information, for example, was you know, my predecessor, Kyle, or the previous director, Michael. So I'm making sure that all of our existing information is up to date is, you know, one facet of this goal, but primarily the second facet is to, you know, establish more interactive ways for, you know, members of the public, if they want to understand, you know, what are key historic buildings that this commission would want to highlight to actively pinpoint that on various city web pages. So, you know, if you want to learn, for example, a brief history of a specific historic building, you'll have the wherewithal to do so or understanding, you know, the architectural style of specific buildings, understanding, maybe potentially even seeing historic photos of various buildings here um, in, his, in the city's historic districts, that would be something that we discussed last month that would be uh, a worthwhile worthwhile endeavor to do so. So as kind of a good segue for that, one of the challenges that we put down is that likely implementing this goal will come in unison with some of the subsequent, subsequent goals that we'll be talking about. So, you know, the purpose, there's a reason why the timeline for achieving this goal is, you know, for the most part, just saying ongoing, because uh, like I said, implementing this goal likely will come in unison with some of the other goals. So the second challenge that we talked about is, is that, you know, you got to play the fine line of making sure that, you know, these cities web, our cities web, web pages are interactive, they're comprehensive, but also easy to use, making sure that whatever information that's presented by city staff on consultation with uh, community media, with um, the city's GIS technician, making sure that it's not overwhelming, that you're, it, you, you kind of have a, a mind rock, for example, that it's easy to understand and disseminate. So be happy to take any you know, comments, questions, revisions you want to see. Adam, this is Mary. I have a question. Um, if all the city departments are, are doing these goals, I'm hoping that other departments have a similar goal about making their areas of the website more interactive and user friendly. So um, I, I'd like, I, I would hope at a citywide level that the, any goals about our website would be dealt with on a city level, not just on a department level. I know my experience as an alder person, um, there are, are really some issues, major issues with user friendliness on the website if you're trying to do research on anything. And uh, I, well, I, I hope somebody will give voice to those and, and it can be worked on on a citywide level. So I guess that might affect the timeline or something. Sure. And, you know, at least from a strategic goal standpoint, I mean, w this is the only department that I'm aware of that's doing these strategic goal sessions with um, their applicable commissions that they um, staff. But I mean, that definitely would be something where, you know, whatever changes that's proposed among staff in this commission to um, John Quirk with community media that um, 
having it stated that if, you know, if some of these actions could translate to other facets, other areas of the city's website, that that would be, you know, depending on its feasibility, on its feasibility for him, you know, that's definitely something that would be, I agree, would be beneficial to make it um, unison in nature. Anybody else? Okay. You want to move on to number three? All right. Goal number three, reviewing the city's facade improvement grant program to overall increase um, citizen participation. So this is something that we talked about last month is, you know, recognize city staff, this commission, um, that we recognize that, you know, there's value to property owners to individuals applying um, towards, a, towards a grant program, uh, specifically for the property owners, specifically for the city, specific for um, improving and maintaining the historic elements of, you know, the specific structure, uh, building, et cetera. So how we outlined achieving this goal is, you know, first off, having a good comprehensive review of the existing program to ultimately see could could there be changes to the existing program and you know some of the areas that's highlighted on your screen you know understanding looking at the specific type of work improvements that are eligible versus not eligible seeing if there if those requirements should stay as is or if there's um, any changes that would be favorable among staff in this commission uh, number two the program bounty program boundary and number three is um, determining whether the existing amount of dollars that are allocated to this program each year is is that sufficient so I mean once that review takes place if there's any changes then of course it would come to uh, this commission for review and consideration and then depending again on the extent of the changes proposed finance or council would have to take a review and approve it as well so that's kind of the first phase. The second phase is more so the education component as well. And one of the ideas or one of the comments made from, um, I forgot which commissioner it was offhand was, you know, trying to also collaborate with local organizations and other third parties as well. Like I believe um, real estate um, brokers were, an example as well, because in more so translating the information that yes, the city does have a facade improvement grant program, you know, it's eligible for specific types of improvements, um, you know, as using those third parties as a venue to try to increase the awareness of the program overall. And of course, you know, there's other educational initiatives that we discussed, you know, flyers, videos, etc. So once this preferred initiatives are determined, that'll be something that, you know, this commission and staff will work collaborative, collaboratively on in um, implementing that and then uh, carrying that on over time. So some of the challenges that we talked about, obviously, budgetary will be one component because, you know, depending on what type of educational initiatives, you know, that of course will uh, accumulate some sort of cost. So we may, implementing certain initiatives may be um, postponed a little bit in order to allocate funds to uh, implement it. And then secondly, any, as will be the case for some other uh, goals I'll discuss later on, some of the initiatives may be um, limited, at least in the get code, as far as it being only in online or video formats, just due to the ongoing pandemic that any in person activities may would have to be likely pushed off sometime into the future once it's good and safe for us to meet in person again. So we happy to take any comments or questions you have. Yeah, years ago, uh, when this was first started, it was restricted strictly to business uh, buildings. Can that be expanded to non-business facilities of some sort or another? I mean, that's, I mean, I can't obviously, you know, commit. There'll have to be some discussions, but that's definitely something that we can take a look at and see, 
you know, the scope, if that's something that we could expand further. Anybody else? Uh, yes, ma'am. Ginger. Yeah, sorry, it took me a while to find mute. Um, <laughs> so currently, has the facade improvement only been applied to businesses within the downtown dist district, historic district? Is so that it's, yeah, so it's been allocated based off of the boundaries of TIF 6, I believe. Okay. And I can pull it up on our on um, the screen later on. But essentially, any proposed work that would fall within the TIF boundary would essentially meet the jurisdictional requirement. And then obviously, any of the uh, further requirements would have to be uh, reviewed and make sure that it's uh, in the fold before we can de definitively say if a program or if a proposal would meet the um, criteria for this program. But, but yeah, so it'd be tip six would be the boundary, which is essentially the, you know, the downtown area, the design review district. It does extend to believe what, less than a handful of parcels on the West side too, but um, that's something I can actually pull up right now. Okay. <laughs> Thankfully, I've been through this page a couple of times, so. All right. There we go. So it'll be this boundary for tip six. Everything that all the parcels that are within red will essentially meet the locational boundary for the facade grant program. All right, any other comments, questions for this goal? Seeing none. All right, goal number, number four. four. Um, educating property owners within the historic and design review districts of the responsibilities and procedures of owning historic property. So this is more so definitely an educational piece of you know, highlighting what this commission's design review requirements are, and then understanding what resources are available for fulfilling any building property improvements that are sought. If it's, you know, grants such as the Facade Improvement Grant Program, if it's, you know, apl applicable loans that are offered on the state or federal level, uh, things like that. And then once that's achieved, you know, producing a flyer, it sounded like was uh, based off of last month's conversations were the preferred route to go as far as distributing the information. And then as one of the commissioners talked about that we should work with third parties as well to would be impacted on any building or property improvements that would occur. So real estate agents for one example. Um, so kind of the challenges, again, were pretty similar, you know, making sure that whatever the cost would be to produce a flyer, that sufficient funds are available within the department budget. And if not, uh, making sure that that allocation occurs for the next fiscal year. And then secondly, that, you know, as we talked about, um, I believe last month as well, that the, the, the commission should be open to the idea of other types of um, educational initiatives as well outside of you know just a flyer you know it, that outside of that educational component there should be also a encouragement component as well kind of emphasizing you know why should these property owners care about the design review requirements you know what's the purpose of it understanding understanding that so you know some of the examples that are shown on your screen is increasing the longevity of, you know, specific historic buildings and structures, restoring historical elements, increasing the value of the property that, you know, creating the cause and effect of, you know, the cause being, hey, we created these design review districts a while, or these design review guidelines a while back. What's the effect of that for not only the city, not only for the historic structure itself, but also for the individual property owners? So focusing more on that encouragement component of it would be beneficial, at least in staff's opinion, to ultimately fulfill this goal going forward. 
Right. So and, years ago, you did the, the flyer came out called Gateway to the Pinery. Are you familiar <laughs> with that? Yes. I have it right on my desk. <laughs> okay. Are you talking about ex expanding that somehow? Th that could be one idea. I mean, one of the topics that we did discuss last month is, you know, for sure kind of outlining more what are the specific requirements within this commission's design guidelines, you know, as it relates to you know, one idea that one topic that was discussed is, you know, making it known to property owners that if you want to do any exterior improvements, exterior work, that you should consult with staff first to, to see if a design review would need to take place that, you know, is either reviewed internally on the staff level or would have to be reviewed by this commission and that, you know, because as I said, there were a couple, I think maybe one instance since I've started um, here in the city where there was a work without a design review um, approval. So making sure that, you know, that is strictly a rarity that that never happens is something that, you know, I would be um, favorable to seeing. But I mean, definitely, you know, expanding, revamping the gateway, um, that's definitely something we can take a look at and see if, I mean, if the commission is open to that, if there's any changes or making it more comprehensive, that's definitely something we can take a look at. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Move on to number five. All right. Creating a map of all historic uh, buildings and landmarks located that were outlined within the intensive survey report back in 2011. So this, you know, my apologies probably for giving some GIS jargon in the um, agenda packet, but what the goal of this um, goal, what the purpose of this goal will be to more visually represent, you know, the extent of which there are historic buildings and landmarks located you know, throughout the city um, as outlined within the 2011 report. So the purpose here, the idea here would be is that we, you know, create specific, create maps, you know, some of the ideas that were turning in my head were, you know, producing a citywide view to see, hey, where are the predominant clusters of historic buildings, historic landmarks? I think we all probably have a pretty good guess, but be at least curious on my end and then secondly making some more um, honed in maps focusing on a specific geographical location um, that would be something that would be worthwhile especially as we get down to the last goal that we'll talk about is you know creating a prioritization model for any future locally recognized historic districts or any future uh, historic areas that we would want to designate to the state and national register of historic places that producing some of these maps would be a good indicator, you know, on a staff level and for this commission to determine, you know, in part, what should be our focus going forward. So that's kind of what we talked about with this goal. And, you know, once those maps are produced with, uh, folks here within this department with the GIS technician here in the city that, you know, we'll um, publish these on the city's website and preferably have it so these maps are interactive in nature. Now, I know one of the things that uh, the intern for this department was actually taking a look at is, and as we'll talk about for further with the historic tours, is are there ways where, say, you could have a map inserted within a city web page that's interactive where, you know, you click on a dot on top of, you know, a historic building and it'll give you, say, a background of the building. It'll give you historic photos, current photos, a timeline of events that took place in said building. Like, understand, creating more of a chronological timeline for each specific um, or certain historic buildings definitely would be something that at least I'm interested in. And it looks like there's been precedent from, um, other cities as well. So I guess last thing I could say is, you know, challenges definitely, as I mentioned earlier, that maybe either filtering some of the 
buildings out that would um, reference in the intensive survey report or focusing on specific geographic locations likely would be best suited because there are a lot of historic buildings and structures that were identified within the report back in 2011. And then, like I said, um, actually creating these maps, depending on the extent that we uh, staff in this commission would want to see with this may be prolonged beyond um, 2022, depending on um, what we would like to see. Um, Tori Jennings, this, uh, this will be fantastic data that will be able to be used for all kinds of things, but this answers my original question about demolition by neglect. So this, this mm -hmm. project, uh, is used for that as well as a multitude of other things moving forward. So this will, I love this. I love maps, um, love GIS. So this is great. Awesome. Would it be at all beneficial? I've read it uh, and it's pretty sophisticated, but would it be at all beneficial to make copies of that 2011 report to distribute to the commission? Yeah, no, absolutely. Are you talking about physical copies or a digital? Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, that's something that we could um print off i mean if there's i mean if i could even ask you now if there's anybody if all uh you commissioners want one we can make it noted and we can start printing them up i don't know if anybody already have has a um, physical copy so yeah i would yeah, like one yeah i think that was included with the materials that i would uh initially okay awesome yeah we can make it noted and then within the next uh few weeks we'll be on we'll be in contact with you if you want to pick it up or we can mail it to you and especially you know i think having the survey report would be beneficial over the next few months when we have that discussion about you know what yes. the, the, uh, when we're talking about the local historic districts or this and the state and national register of historic places that that would be having that um, survey report on file with each of you would be definitely beneficial when we have that discussion. Thank you. This is this is Mary. I, I've got uh, a comment um, that I guess this is a good place to, to say it. I, I know this is all, um, you know, draft-like and that it will change, but as I looked at the entire document, I noted that now there are... Um, at least six, anyhow, the, the timelines for all of these start in 2021. Mm -hmm. And um, it looks, I, I would hope that we could prioritize the goals and be realistic in terms of when things are, might actually be able to, to start. I mean, I, I, I know city staff is extraordinarily capable, but I also know you, <laughs> you have a lot of other stuff going on. And I, I guess I worry, and maybe this is a reflection of my personal agenda setting, but um, if supposedly everybody's doing all of these things, starting all of these things in 2021, does, I guess I'm looking for some prioritization. Sure. So there's a couple of things, I guess. So first off, um, you know, as you know, I think goal five would be a good example here where staff purposely gave a more prolonged um, timeline fulfill fulfilling the first step in the goal. So in this case, essentially given a whole year. Now, likely will it take a whole year to complete this one step? Probably not, but the purpose of this was more so, in part, kind of what you're discussing that, you know, we do recognize that there's in part a need to start most of these goals um, sooner rather than later. So establishing a more prolonged timeline would at least give staff some flexibility to um, appropriately undertake each goal. But, and the second reason too that I wanted to talk about, and we'll, We'll discuss it more in the last goal with the state and national register of uh, historic places. But one of the reasons why we want to proceed with interest in starting these goals in 2021 already, particularly in the summer, is that if there are any of these goals that staff expects will um, 
result in a budget expenditure that we can make note of that, understand, you know, what are the expected costs to fulfill it so we can make that noted and start at uh, Director Pernowski that he can start allocating that already for uh, the 2022 budget. So that's that's part of the reason is just making sure. Okay, that, we're that makes sense. Ready. Anybody else? <clears throat> yeah, I just had a quick comment. This is uh, alternate Keemer. Um, in terms of making the map searchable, I think it would be important to kind of lay out ahead of time um, which characteristics of the homes you want to be able to search by, um, like how you want to index it. And I mean, yeah, obviously, you know, date makes sense and location. One of the ways I remember that document being organized is by geographic style. So they list like the examples of like all the brick bungalows or all the Victorian homes. So I could see that potentially being useful. You know, if you buy a house on Clark Street that is of a certain design and you wanna like look and see what where other homes of that type are located, how people have, you know, dealt with the bric-a-brac in the front of their facade or what that house might've looked like years past that, yeah, architectural style might be, I mean, not sure how, you know, or just along that line, what are other characteristics that people might, you know, wanna search by? And I mean, obviously that could go on you know, quite extensively. So you'd have to kind of, you know, prioritize your scope, but. Which I think, you know, that's a good point because I think a lot of that information we already have in part from the survey report that uh, Tim Hagelin did about a decade ago now, I believe that that, you know, it ascertains a lot of those questions that or a lot of those comments that you said, as far as the um, specific materials materials that were used, uh, things like that. And the second thing too is our assessor data would have at least be a good starting point and have some of that information as well that we could just plug from their data onto some of the um, into some of these specific data points. But no, I definitely agree that you know once we um, took a, take a look at the survey report that that'll be one of the things that staff in this commission will have to discuss is what we would want to see on that map. You know, what are the specific data that you want to know? I mean, some of the basics I'm sure would be, you know, what was the year, the year that the building was constructed would likely be one, you know, what are, what's the existing use, the previous uses, um, historic photos, but outlining all of those, those details would definitely be something we'll have to, um, Discuss in the future. I'm Anyone curious, else? Commissioner Brish, or sorry, um, Scripps <laughs> uh, <laughs> recommended a um, what would you call this? Um, I, I'm wondering if you have experience in exactly what they're talking about right now. Can you put in, because I really like the idea of having a category of architectural styles that makes a lot of sense. So this, um, what you're talking about, Sarah, does that align with that? Yeah, so the link I sent you is actually, um, it was a federally grant funded project where for um, a community, we put together neighborhood tours um, and it included um, both like physical pamphlets that you could take for a walking or driving tour, as well as uh, virtual tours that you could go on. And the virtual component also had oral history interviews linked and images and whatnot. Um, it was an expensive multi-year project, but you could certainly scale it. And what's nice too, is that you can also add tours, like they, they added cultural tours like that were like specific to the Jewish community and African-American historic sites and things like that. Um, and so you could start with like a, you know, one or two community, like Main Street, right? And then branch out from there. Um, and so that was just to kind of give a template of, of something that we did. Um, and we did include architectural styles, but we also included other types of nor no historically significant things like, you know, a former governor lived in one house or a house that was on in the Green Book um, and things like that. So that, that's that project, but it certainly, I think, could work as a potential model for um, the goals of the city. Uh, 
we're kind of drifting into number six. Is that okay with you, Adam? No, I think, I think that's fine too. I think, you know, kind of what we discussed before, some of these goals are definitely intertwined. So um, I guess what I can do, I can give a quick uh, rundown of goal six, and then we can discuss um, that component as well. Um, so I guess this goal, you know, developing historic tours of the downtown and other historic areas in the city. So, you know, first off, the step would be is determining, you know, are there historic areas that's located outside of the downtown area that this commission would be interested in? And what I'm talking about here is primarily, so the proposed historic districts that we'll talk about later on, you know, like Sunset Forks, for example, or uh, Intersection of Church and Ellis, the church is there, you know, are there, are there other areas that this commission would be interested in um, highlighting as part of historic tours? So once these details are kind of squared away, determining, and especially determining the scope of each tour, you know, talking about focusing on focusing in on what are the specific topics that you just that you'll be discussing it'll, it'll, if it'll be you know the existing historic structure the past history of a given property you know data of construction things like that that you know kind of focusing the scope on it to key areas would probably likely be beneficial to skip in because there will be a lot of things that I'm sure you know folks could talk about as part of the tour. So just making sure that it's short and concise as possible would be um, beneficial. So once those details are figured out, you know, we had this good discussion last month of engaging with other local organizations, local businesses, prop other property owners of historic um, uh, lots to make sure, well, to not only educate them of the purpose of these historic tours, but possibly, um, have them participate potentially in some way. So, you know, one of the ideas that I was thinking about is if there's any property owners, any businesses who would be open to the idea of possibly doing an interior tour as well, if there's specific, you know, historical features that would be of interest to this commission. I mean, that's something that we could include as part of an overall tour. And then like, lastly, obviously implement, implementing it, holding these tours and, you know, one of the details that we'll have to figure out down the road is who's going to be essentially the person giving the tour. Was it going to be uh, city staff? If it's, it's going to be, you know, a commissioner of this commission, if it's going to be a third party, something like that would have to be squared away. And then uh, some of the things that as we'll talk, I guess, jump into one of the challenges as well is, Likely in-person um, tours are going to be limited, likely going to have to be postponed again, just based off of the fact that we're, you know, still in a pandemic. So, you know, one possibility that would be of interest is doing, is recording, video recording one of these tours that are held in person um, down the road. So, you know, if folks, you know, in the summertime, if you've got a lot of things going on, that there's just time constraints or whatnot, that if you want to still learn about historic features in a given area, but don't have the time to, you could watch videos that would be uploaded on the city's website, for example. And as I mentioned before, the department's intern has been looking at a lot of other um, ways to fulfill these goals. Now, one of the things that he looked at that it might be hard to, it might not be as feasible, but is to essentially create an app where, you know, you could essentially do a self-guided historic tour. So, you know, are there ways that we could focus on, you know, the self-guided tour standpoint where, again, even outside of just watching a video on your desktop, are there ways, other platforms that we could, you know, present this information and then have, you know, folks learn about it as they're on the sidewalk walking towards each building. So, I think this is definitely in a nutshell, this is a goal that, you know, I'm this personally probably one of my favorite, just given that, you know, there's a lot of things that you can say in a uh, historic tour and a lot of things you can learn. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about this goal. I'm happy to hear any comments you may have. 
Marshfield produced, I think it was five pamphlets, themed pamphlets, similar to what Sarah's talking about, uh, so that if a person was interested, say, in churches, uh, mm -hmm. you could pick up the uh, pamphlet on churches, and then it was they were all walking tours, so they were all obviously within a distance of each other, and then just simply go from place to place, and it was self-guided. Uh, and then you could pick those up at the courthouse or some other place of distribution. But they had about five of them. They were really very, very creatively done. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's definitely one option that we could do. I think the thing with a flyer is, you know, would it be a flyer more so like, um, I, I guess more so like how many, one of the things that we would have to discuss is, how many buildings would we include in a flyer? How many historic properties would we include? So, and I think that is kind of what I was mentioned before, understanding, discussing the scope of these tours. What should be the prioritized locations? Um, what should be the prioritized information that we translate if it's a in-person tour, if it's a um, self-guided tour, if it's a, um, if it's a pamphlet, things like that, but that's, you know, definitely something we'll have to discuss, but no, I like, I like the idea. Definitely. I like um, adding to that and different ways of communicating, but I love the app idea and just figuring out, you know, new ways to communicate and taking advantage of new technology, which has been delivered to us because of, of COVID, right. New ways of, of doing things. So yeah, I think there's tons of potential here. And also this will move us forward into the future. Things that we're not even thinking about right now, but the app idea, almost everyone has a phone. So that's a really, that's a really good one. Um, <clears throat> Adam, not only with this item, but I think the previous ones too, is there, a, I think it would be interesting to explore a, a way for whether it be business owners or people in the community that have frequented businesses or homeowners to submit the information themselves. So maybe they have stories about that property. Um, you know, so it's not just about this is the place, this is when it was built, da 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 da, you know, that kind of factual information. But, you know, whenever I've been on tours, what has made them interesting is the stories behind them. So, uh, you know, I know even with our own house, we were given a packet of information from previous landlord or previous homeowner about, you know, information that they've collected about it. So is there some way of uploading information into these particular interactive um, you know, sites, whether it be tours or whether it be a website, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, if it's more so like an app or any web-based features that we, we would use, I think that's definitely something um, that would be doable. You know, actually, when you were talking about that, one of the things that jumped in my mind is, you know, even... Yeah, having interior photos that you know any property owners may be open to giving to us or any any things like that would be worthwhile. And I think you know more so too that could if we would some I, again I don't know if this is feasible from the uh, community media standpoint, but you know if there's ways that you could insert that information if you're an individual property owner. I think that just in a way opens up a Pandora's box of, you know, learning so much more, like you said, learning these stories, you know, if there's any famous people who used to stop, who used to frequent at, you know, a said tavern, for example, you know, 50 years ago. I mean, those would be the stories that, I, like you said, is definitely integral in a lot of tours that I've um, been accustomed to in the past, I would mean, definitely be interested, interesting to, to do and know more. Anyone else? Okay, seeing none, you want to move on to seven? 
Yeah, goal number seven is in introducing additional signage in the city's historic districts. So this is something that I, definitely one of my more favorite goals as well, in that one, as we discussed last month, one of the, um, essentially the first step that we would have to do among staff in this commission is you know, determining what types of signage are desired you know, focusing more so on, you know, what types of signs. And I know, again, the department's intern has been supplying me some information as far as what other uh, cities nearby have been doing as well. So, you know, understanding, you know, what should be the proposed, what should be the more preferable types of signage would be really the first step that we should do, you know, if you should target more so wayfinding signs, talking about, you know, a specific local landmark or business is located, you know, certain direction, things like that. Do you want um, signage that you can affix on top of um, stop signs saying, you know, his, uh, the Clark Street Historic District is that way, you know, things like that would be the first step. And then of course, the next step would be is consulting with the public works department because likely such signage would likely fall within the right of way. So making sure that from that standpoint, there, um, there's open conversation with them. And then of course, um, identifying a budget for implementing that. And signage is likely going to be something too, where, you know, depending on the scope that um, is entertained for this goal, that this will likely, you know, potentially span over, uh, over multiple years in terms of budgeting for it. Again, depending on, you know, how much how much signs this commission and staff would be interested in. And then, like I said, lastly, obtaining proper approvals would be um, the end step before in, uh, installing said signs. So as far as challenges, you know, one of the things that we talked about too is that, you know, making sure that there's collaboration with property owners just to make sure that you know, especially during the design process, when you're figuring out, you know, the specifics about a certain type of sign in terms of size, in terms of the message that's being displayed, location, things like that, that there's at least an open conversation um, with any applicable parties who would be impacted by this just to make sure um, that they're okay with it. And then again, collaborating with local organizations as well would be beneficial for in part spreading the word. And I know uh, the Public Works Department has had conversations with other uh, folks here in the city as far as signage um, in this area. So that, you know, definitely would be beneficial to, you know, continue that discussion as it relates to our goal. So I guess I don't know if there's any comments as far as, you know, certain types of signage that you're interested that we can make note of already, at least, again, when it comes towards um, Budget allocation. Yeah, I have um, Tori Jennings. I I have really strong opinions on this one because we have way way too many signs in this city, sure. and we have a sign pollution problem. And I'm really glad that Sarah Brish from the Convention and Vero Visitors Bureau is working with the Streets Department to um, sort of pull that back in and, and reorganize. And I think wayfinding signs are a really a waste of money. But what I feel strongly about is having the street signs themselves be a different color and, and maybe a different shape. I realize that that can be really costly and it's something I think you see more on the Eastern seaboard, um, but, or back East in play in older cities, but that's a really effective way to say, to communicate you are in a different space right now. And um, it can be just a different color, of sign rather than green. So something that's what, that would be my preference. I'm just throwing it out. Yeah. Cause oh, one of the oh, things that is, I was, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'll echo Tori. I, I used to live on the East coast and um, I, I saw that a lot and it's really effective. It's so, I, I don't know. It just really works. Yeah. And what I was going to say too, is, you know, as somebody who didn't grow up here in the city, that, you know, when I first moved up here, I mean, of course, you know, 
I wouldn't be able to tell you when I'm driving around saying, I wouldn't be able to know at least to, to start, hey, you're now driving into the Clark Street Historic District or, you know, other, you know, Matthias Mitchell Historic District that, you know, for visitors of the city or just people who just don't know the exact boundaries of it, the city's historic districts that having these signs would, having these three signs would definitely help in that regard of, you know, highlighting, hey, you are now entering the, again, Clark Street Historic District, because at least I'm sure what would happen to me is, you know, I would start by looking at, you know, the buildings along the both sides of the streets and seeing, you know, understanding more of the architectural styles of the home. So I think that as uh, the last two speakers have been discussing, like, that's a really effective uh, way of communicating where the historic districts are. And again, it's something that's been um, commonly applied across other municipalities as well, like you said, on the Eastern side of the States. And that color coding could be echoed in the map project, right? So whether you have online mapping or whatever, the colors coincide and, and um, repeat themselves basically. Sure. All right, any other? Y'all, excuse me, um, this is Mary. I get to go to the dentist. So uh, I need to leave the meeting. Sure. <laughs> so Thank you. have fun. All right, we can head over to goal number eight. So goal number eight is adopt a historic preservation plan. So this goal and the last goal is definitely going to be the two goals that are going to be most prolonged in nature. It's going to definitely take several years likely to uh, fulfill. So, you know, as we discussed last month that this is one of the key deliverables within chapter 22 that um, is preferred from this commission to establish, to adopt a historic preservation plan. So, you know, some of the discussion, some of the topics that are shown on your screen is, you know, to start having these stakeholder meetings with impacted parties to, you know, determine what are these uh, priorities that should be included within a historic preservation plan because chapter 22 does give a list of different criteria that should be included within a historic preservation plan and um, I could always pull it up later on but you know some of the examples are you know specific height requirements such as saying that the uh, maximum height elevation should be you know, compatible should be similar when you're jumping from one building to another, that there shouldn't be stark um, elevation differences between um, buildings as well. So ha we should have these stakeholder meetings def because, you know, from a structural standpoint, from a design standpoint that, you know, it's going to have impact. So having these stakeholder meetings, again, this common, common nature with any type of you know, longer term planning processes would be beneficial for staff and for this commission to determine what would be the most um, preferred criteria guidelines to include within such a plan. And as you showed on, and on the screen, you did include some specific stakeholders that, um, again, are just listed, but there's plenty more. Um, and following the stakeholder meetings, you know, the next step will essentially be writing the historic preservation plans based off of, you know, all the data, all the accumul all the information that's been accumulated through these meetings and then um, consultation with appropriate departments as well would likely have to take place. Cause as I mentioned in one of the challenges is some of these guideline criteria that's used in uh, the historic preservation plan as it relates to chapter 22. So again, height restrictions on structures, density requirements, or et cetera, are definitely related to the zoning code and would likely have to be discussed in relation with the zoning code rewrite that would happen in a few years from now. So I guess I'll just, 
again, jump through this first challenge is that establishing an exact timeline for fulfilling this goal will could be complicated just given that some of these criteria that's going to be measured and discussed within such a plan is has a direct impact with other type of other sections of, of the municipal code as well. So, and then I guess the last part, you know, talking about the um, approval process, it would have to approve, be approved, reviewed and approved by this commission, by the plan commission and common council as well. So I guess let's just jump to some of these challenges as well. So one of the topics that we discussed as well, that was of interest, broadly speaking, from this commission is to include um, more of a cultural identification process as well, to focus on more of the cultural preservation as well within um, this historic preservation plan as well. So, and that's something that, as we discussed last month, will definitely require, you know, an exec, an extensive collaboration with, you know, UWSP, any, um, tribal organizations, thing, any other applicable organizations that would be of interest and in if the commission would be, would want to pursue more of a cultural component as well in, uh, within this historic preservation plan as well. So, and then I guess the last thing, making sure that these guidelines are in unison, that they're not at odds with any um, requirements through state statutes, through the Department of Interior as well. So making sure that there's research on historic preservation requirements through those two avenues would have to occur upon um, having stakeholder meetings and subsequently producing the plan itself. So let me actually quick pull up the um, guidelines as well through chapter 22 but i guess while i'm pulling that up are there any comments or questions to start all right so hopefully you can see my screen so these are the guideline criteria that i was mentioning before so talking about you know all new structures shall be constructed to be a height visually compatible with the building environment for which they're located and all the way down to um, subsection m and you know one thing that would be made of note is that you know some of these would have similarities to the commission's design guidelines as well so you know just making sure that when staff in this commission goes forward with the planning process for uh, producing this plan that there is at least a review of the commission's design guidelines as well as it relates to uh, this plan too so you can definitely see that i mean this would be more of an exhaustive more of a comprehensive goal to fulfill but it's definitely is something that's you know specifically identified within the commission's charter and I would be definitely happy to, you know, see what will come about of it in the future. So are there any comments, questions that you have? All right. Let's nope. see none. <clears throat> I'll head over to the last goal. So goal number nine, creating and implementing a strategic plan for areas to be locally designated as a historic district and nominated to the state and national register of historic places. So as we talked about last month, there are designated areas through the 2011 House um, Historic Intensive Survey Report that are defined as new or potential future historic districts. So this first step would be essentially to have this discussion as far as prioritizing from a local standpoint, from a local historic district, and then from the state and national register standpoint of these proposed historic districts, what are, you know, what should be prioritized 
to be locally recognized versus state and nationally recognized. More so to understand from a staff level, you know, when the commission decides to um, designate another area as a local historic district in the future, regardless of how short or long term that will be, we at least have a good indicator as well. And then also from the state and national register standpoint um, as well, making sure that we have, you know, this prioritization kept in mind as far as what should be the next area that we designate. So as kind of what I alluded to before, this would really be the first step. And the reason why I put that as spring is more so the spring of this year as far as having this discussion is that once we figure out more so what area should be designated next to the state national registration uh, register of historic places that the city would have to allocate dollars if it's in the 2022 budget or potentially thereafter as far as um, seeking out a historic consultant to take care of the application process for submitting nomination papers to to the state and federal level as you know as this commission is aware a few years back when tim hagelin did it for the clark street historic district as well to the state and national level so this is definitely something that you know will likely take place this spring yet as i said so we'll i guess give a little heads up too. We'll for sure have a meeting next month and I'll give you, I'll confirm the dates with you um, in April and a few weeks from now, but that's something that I would expect to have a conversation next month already to at least get the ball rolling on, you know, what are these areas that you prefer, uh, particularly on the state and national level. So once that's determined, if we have our set site on what historic area should be designated next, then the next step would be, you know, city staff preparing to submit an RFP for seeking out a contracted consultant to prepare and submit these nomination papers for it. And again, the benefit here is that as what happened a few years back with the Clark Street Historic District is that some of the a lot of the information and just background work that took place for filling out the application um, it really relied on the 2011 housing intensive survey report which would be benefit as which is at least beneficial in our for the city stance in that obviously the reports already made a lot of the legwork is already done so that's kind of why the timetable potentially could be a little bit reduced versus having to, you know, do a more robust detailed review of each parcels within a defined historic area before we end up submitting the papers. So once the RFP is sent out and a consultant is subsequently um, contracted out, more so than the work will be it'll be more so the contracted consultant who would take the the lead on a lot of the back work and you know he or she they'll definitely um consult with city staff and this commission as far as you know funding opportunities that would be prefer a preference you know as i mentioned there's cert mentioned on your screen certified local government grants i know that was um a fund mechanism that was used the last time around with the clark street nomination papers. So making sure that obviously funds are accumulated and then really, like I said, it'll be the consultant who would take the reins in thereafter as far as doing the background work on submitting the application and ultimately hearing the results. So that's from the state national standpoint, from a local standpoint, you know, it's a lot less, it's a lot shorter of a process to nominate a area to the on the local level as a historic district i mean that you know it would occur on the from this commission from the common council as well but one of the things that i discussed early on is you know before we even go forward with submitting an rfp for the state and national standpoint or even having more intense discussions about 
the local historic district, what would need to happen is, you know, again, to have these stakeholder meetings, because as we discussed in some of the previous goals, uh, one of the target areas that we have to focus on is at least staff would be preferent or would be favorable towards is focusing on the why do we care? If you're speaking of a you know a specific property owner, a local business, you know what does it mean to be locally recognized, to be located within a historic district? You know what are the benefits uh, for them specifically? What are the benefits benefits for the historic structure that they're residing in or operating the business out of? So having these stakeholder meetings will definitely be. Uh, one of these first steps that will have to occur just again to make sure that you know if there are any changes that or any outcomes that would occur that potentially could be contrary to what city staff and this commission wants to see that you know we make that noted and we um, alternate the processes as um, as applicable so i guess from a if are there any questions as it relates to you know the the process of local designation or state and national designation and uh, more so the prioritization of what should be the next locally recognized and state uh, federal federally recognized historic areas. One of the things we did back in 1983, when the city was celebrating its 125th, was to send out a form to people, they could submit themselves, uh, to be designated as a local historic house uh, residence. We specifically had, had it for residences. And we got more submissions than we could handle for people taking pride in their building. And they would fill out, a based on whatever information they had, fill out this form and then they would give an, a, oh, I don't know, a document of some sort designating the house uh, as a historic building. And that involved people in their own buildings. It got people interested in doing it. That was very successful. Yeah, and I think that definitely would go on the, in the area of, you know, engaging any impacted parties because I think from what you're <laughs> discussing I'm guessing there was a significant amount of outreach that occurred prior to you know even sending out these mailers to you know discuss hey you know what you know we want you to designate your house um, or to recognize your house you know what are the benefits if you do so so and I think that you know would will be one of the, as I said, uh, target area that will have to occur early on is having these discussions, but more so the responses we get will likely dictate, you know, what steps we take going forward too. Okay. And like I said, I mean, likely next month we'll be um, discussing more in detail as far as, you know, the um, designated or the proposed historic areas as discussed in the 2011 report in more detail as far as, you know, what you want to prefer, what would be the preferred areas going forward to be locally recognized or state and nationally recognized. So, I mean, from that standpoint, we'll be discussing that likely more so in April. Okay. Any questions for Adam? Okay, seeing none. Do uh, you have any further comments, Mr. Kuhn? No further comments with the um, strategic planning documents. So, otherwise, the last thing here would be, you know, if this commission is um, comfortable with what you see on the screen and within your agenda packet, then um, staff would be looking for a motion to approve the um, strategic goals document and place it in file. And then um, this file will be sent over to, well, kept on the city staff level and sent to the commission. And we'll use that again, like I said, as a guiding principle going forward to, to implement these goals. 
With that in mind, I'd entertain a motion to accept the strategic goals as printed here. I move to accept. Mr. DeBush, thank you. A second, please. A second. I'll second. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jennings. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Ginger? Yep, am I allowed to vote since there's not enough people? <laughs> or, yes, all right, I, yep. I agree. Okay, uh, opposed? Seeing none, it passed. Okay. Awesome, so I think, I guess, like I said, I'll be in discussion, I'll send out an email to you all likely next week or so as far as establishing an April meeting day because I was anticipating there'd be some design review requests this month already, but ended up just didn't shake it and it did not shake out as planned. So likely next month as well, we'll for sure have a few uh, design review as design review requests as well, in addition to um, implementing some of these goals. Thank you. So. Thank you. Adam, are you available tomorrow morning at some point? I am. Mm -hmm. Could I see you about ten o'clock? In uh, in person here, or yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. I can set okay. that on my schedule. Thank you. Anything further? Otherwise, we are adjourned. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye. Right, bye. bye. Thank <clears throat> you. Take care. <laughs>